Okay, started the recording here. Yeah, everyone, thanks for waiting. Uh, probably just give it another couple of minutes. As I can see, there's still some more people joining. And then we will crack on. There's also about a 20 second lag on uh, the audio. So 
I think it might be a little bit hard to respond to questions uh, live, but if you just kind of chuck them in there, then I will go through them uh, at the end. Also, I've never done this before, so can someone just uh, let me know if the uh, the mic is working correctly? You can all hear me. All right, okay. So first, thanks everyone for joining. Um, hopefully we're gonna go over some good stuff today and uh, I'm gonna go through my process of how I get one of my tracks ready to mix down. Um, just to be clear, I'm not really gonna go through much actual mixing here. It's just kind of a, uh, what I find a really essential part before the actual mixing begins and uh, I guess I started doing it this way a couple of years ago and it really kind of revolutionized how uh, effective kind of my mix downs were and uh, I just managed to get a much more clear and full sounding mix at the end of it and uh, so what I do is I mean this is going to be applicable whether you use Logic or Ableton or any uh, DAW. But personally, I write all my music on Ableton and then I export all the stems and move them into Logic and then I do my mix down in Logic. And that's just a personal preference. I just like how uh, Logic looks when it comes to mixing things down. I think it looks a bit more clear and yeah, I find Ableton works better when it comes to being creative with ideas. So what uh, I do this, what I do here is I mix with audio stems rather than mixing as I go. So to be clear, I write the song, I arrange the song, um, and then once it's kind of pretty much all good to go, I export all the stems, turn them into audio, and then I put them into Logic, and from there I start a new mix down project, which is different to how I did it for years, and I think how many people, when they start producing, um, is how they do it, which is they mix as they go. And so why do you want to prepare a mix with a new project with audio stems rather than mixing as you go? Well... I can only really talk from my own experience, but I found that when I would mix as I go, I would be kind of writing and mixing. And uh, you know what, actually, I'm gonna switch the video over real quick to uh, full to here. Here we are, then you can see me. Um, while I just kind of go over why I do this process. Um, 
So, as I was saying, when I was mixing as I went, I'd be kind of writing and then mixing, I'd add in some new elements, and then I'd end up doing some work on the mix at the same time, stick some compression on this snare, kind of stick some delay on this synth, and I'd kind of be working on each little bit, and maybe I'd get that bit sounding good, but then I'd kind of move over into writing some more, I'd get another idea, add in a bass line, etc. And there wasn't much kind of cohesion to it, and I'd end up missing bits that I hadn't mixed. And then everything just kind of ended up being a bit jumbled. And uh, then I would, um, yeah, I'd find that the mix wasn't sitting well, and I'd end up kind of then going back to try and fix the hi-hats. And I'd get the hi-hats sounding good, but then I couldn't hear the shakers. And then I start mixing all the drums again and then all the drums would be really loud and then I couldn't hear the melodic elements and everything would just be kind of fighting fires, just fixing each bit as I went over and over again. But there was always so much sound in the track that I couldn't really focus on each bit individually. Um, then on top of that, the project might be a bit slow because I had tons of plugins going, I had different synths running. I had tons of different effects going on. And so, uh, yeah, you get a slow project. Um, and yeah, it was all just kind of a bit of a jumble. Sometimes I'd get a great mix down. Sometimes I'd get a crap mix down. Uh, there wasn't really too much rhyme or reason to it. And then one day I, someone explained to me what I'm going to explain here. And then I moved to starting a new project and uh, doing a mix from scratch. And um, yeah, so when you mix from stems, you get a clean start and you create a framework to mix every track the same way. So once you kind of get into the rhythm of doing it this way, you should end up getting an effective mix every single time. Um, on one hand, yeah, as I said before, you're going to have a much faster project because there's going to be far fewer plugins, far fewer, well, there'll be no synths, there'll be no samplers, it's just audio. And so you can kind of get the workflow going, then the computer's nice and fast, you don't have to stop and wait for stuff to load or anything like that. Um, another good thing about it is that all the effects are obviously already on the tracks and already printed like your delays, etc. So when you're listening through the track, you know, if it's with MIDI and you're still writing, if you've got like a long delay and a build up, you have to actually start listening to the track from when that hit happens and then listen all the way through to hear the delay working. Whereas in this case, you know, you can just start along the audio at any time you want and hear what's going on. Um, and yeah, so... Like inevitably, when I'm writing, there is still a bit of mixing that kind of goes on as I go along. Like, I don't think anybody just does just writing and then 100% just mix down separately. But I try and keep it as separate as I can. And um, yeah, so that's kind of the reason why we moved over to doing it this way. And now let's actually go through the process of doing that. Um, so, I'm gonna, what have I got here? Uh, da, da, da. Sorry, getting used to, I want camera off, full display capture on. And here we are. So, I'd be in Ableton. This is an example. Uh, this, this could be a project that I was working on, right? I mean, it's actually a lot of audio that I kind of dragged back in here just to make this tutorial, but for uh, the sake of the video, let's just assume that there's a bunch of MIDI. I've got some MIDI in here. Um, obviously in a in another track, there'd be a lot more. Um, but so say I finish my track here, right? Now I want to export my stems and I do this by going to file, export audio video. And then instead of just the master, I click on all individual tracks and then I want to do it at the bit depth that I was that I've been writing at. So that's twenty four, 
with no dither, either a WAV or an AFE, that's fine. And then export, and it will export all your stems. And if you're on Logic, you just go to File, Export, and then All Tracks as Audio Files. And then here we are. I'll go to Extend File Length to Project End, put them in somewhere uh, easy to find. I have a, a Music, Stems, and then I'll put my stems into there, right? Bounce them all in. So you export all your stems, and then uh, you just grab them in here. All right, and uh, then I just grab them all, and I would drag them into Logic in this new one, which I've already done to save us time on loading all of them. But uh, yeah, so this is basically what the beginning of the project is going to look like. And, oh, I should have actually just said one thing before, which was creating a mix template. So I haven't just dragged these into an empty project. What I've got here is uh, an already created mix template. And this is, this will save you a lot of time. So my mix template is 45 tracks and each of them has an SSL channel on it and a Renaissance EQ on it as well. And then in the master, I've got a span, uh, the Voxengo span, frequency analyzer, and isotope insight, which I really only use actually for kind of the stereo mix. So I kind of get rid of all of these. And then we've just got I'd have uh, this down here and I'd have this up here. And so every project is kind of like I start with the template and then I drag all the stems into the template from there, right? And you can do the exact same thing in Ableton. You would just create a project that uh, looked, like, looked like the same way. You'd create 30, 40 audio tracks, put a compressor and an EQ on each one and then those same uh, plugins on the master, the frequency analyzer and uh, stereo image analyzer. And then you just uh, save the project as, and you save it in your uh, Ableton user library templates. And then once it's saved in there, you can just open that project up from, uh, from the templates folder whenever you want, and then drag all your audio files into there. So what we have here is uh, I'd have a new template, I'd open it up, drag all the audio files in and might have to do a little bit of renaming, but uh, eventually you'd have everything lined up nicely here. And then what I do is uh, go through each, uh, each track and um, you know name them correctly so you, you can see what's going on. You know, this is largely about just like organizing things very effectively and that's what's going to make things a lot easier then once you've got everything in an order here i've got all the drums here then i've got the bass then i've got all my melodic elements down into into here and then i've got some effects here and then some sends as well that were printed now i want to put these all into groups all right and we do that by selecting all of the drums and then in logic you press apple shift d which creates a, a summing stack and then we call this drums do uh, same thing with the melodic Same thing with the effects. And the sends. And then with the bass, what I tend to do is uh, I'll actually 
take a, I like to split it in half and have two two uh, tracks here. So duplicate it, and then we're going to have a high and a low, and this is going to make it easier to mix. So we duplicate that, um, just solo the high one, get a uh, little loop going here, and then bring up the equalizer here, and now we're going to play it, and uh, I'm just going to cut out, I'm going to low pass, sorry, high pass, um, upwards until we have just kind of the higher element of the bass left here, right? So, turn this on, and then I'm going to press play. And then bring this up. So can we hear kind of uh, what's going on here? So I reckon it's going to want to be around there, around 130. And then with the low, we'll see what this is like if we cut off the top end to 130. Oh, sorry. Maybe we could go a tiny bit lower, 120. Yeah, that sounds about right. Okay. So then we do bring this down to 120, and um, then stick those into another little group. And that's bass. Um, I mean, it's kind of slightly self-explanatory, but uh, I guess obviously the, the reason you want to have these separated is you might want to do two different types of things to them in the mix. Um, the really low end of the bass, probably want to have that in mono. Maybe you want to be doing some side chaining to the kick, which you might not want to hear in the top end. And then I might want to do some different effects in the high section of the bass. Maybe I want to put some more distortion on it and I want that to just affect the top, but uh, not affect the bottom. And so what we've done is just basically, if you now just uh, solo this bass, it will sound exactly the same as if you just had one without the EQ on, but you've just, uh, yeah, made it so it's easier to mix there. So we've got our two sections there. And now what we're going to get into is some coloring. So Alt-C brings up the color in Logic. Um, if you're in Ableton, you just right click on anything and you can choose colors. So then we're going to make each of these different ones, different groups, a different color. Uh, I mean, it all sounds like slightly trivial stuff, right? But actually, it all comes together to create a, uh, a better final mix down in the end. So, oh, sorry, with these ones, you got to, fortunately, uh, highlight everything all at the same time. So we've got, what's this? These are sins. Cool. So I like these in red. The bass is going to be yellow. The melodic stuff is going to be this blue. The effects, this purple. And uh, there we have everything nice and colored. And already you can see it's just so much easier to be able to see what's going on. You can see the whole track, you can see all the audio, you can see every section where it begins and ends super clearly, and uh, should have a much easier time. So after that, uh, you're going to want to bring everything down to zero, um, but not the groups. So highlight just the the tracks themselves and not the summing groups bring that all the way down to zero and now there should be silence when we play all good 
And now we're ready to basically start our mix. And I kind of go through a little bit of the process of what that would be. I would just find the uh, most kind of built up area of drums, get a little loop going, and then start by just bringing up the kick and just mix the kick, right? So you just get the kick sounding exactly how you want it. And then once you've got the kick sounding good, then bring up the low part of the bass, mix that into the kick, high part of the bass, bring that into the kick, and then start mixing the rest of the drums one by one. I mean, this isn't a very complicated drum track, so there's only uh, five stems there, but you know, you might have however many, five, 10, 15 different drum and percussion tracks. And what I do is I just start bringing up each element one by one and mixing that into the rest of them. And I start with the elements that I want to be most prominent in the track and do those first and then make my way until the ones I want to be most quiet, I do last. Um, and then once you've done all the drums and you've done the bass and you've mixed those together, then you mix in the melodic elements the same way, one by one, and then the effects, and then finally the sends. And then you should have everything all sitting there together nicely, right? And then the final kind of bit of the puzzle is doing some extra mixing on these groups themselves. So on the drums, I often use a multi-band compression just to kind of finish them off. I use uh, this one here, the linear phase multi-band from Waves, but you know, there's uh, ones within Logic and in Ableton as well. So you don't necessarily need to use this one. Um, I also like to use UE uh, satin tape emulation as well on uh, these groups. You know, I've made a, a chunky gritty preset. It just gives the drums a lot of extra punch and boost at the end, but it does it kind of all together as the group and it creates more uh, cohesion in the drum track. So yeah, so I'll do kind of yeah, mix each group one by one. And then at this stage, once everything has been you know, mixed and it sounds good together, you then you don't need to worry about mixing each individual track so much. Then you can go into just mixing the groups. So once the drums sound great, then all you need to do is make sure that all the drums together are the right volume compared to the bass and the melodic. So at this stage, you would just play with the levels on each of the groups rather than the individual tracks. And uh, yeah, that is basically uh, how I do the mix. And it seems like it might take a little bit of time to, uh, to do. And I know sometimes, yeah, let's go for this. Yeah, I know it can sometimes feel like you're adding in all this extra time and extra work into the process when you could just be mixing it as you go along. But trust me, in the long run, it's actually, you get quite fast at doing it and it will make the whole process so much faster. Um, yeah, so that is, that's my process. And yeah, I hope you guys find it useful. I'm gonna see if uh, we'll do the general Q&A section. Get into the typing over here. Got one, ooh, got some coming in on the Instagram. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, so Alex Dodd says, 
I think I vaguely remember you saying that you mainly use VSTs on your podcast. Do you have any favourites or any in particular you'd recommend for the minimal breakbeat UKG sort of sounds in your tracks? Also, given that going to clubs, etc. isn't an option at the moment, have you found any new, different or unusual sources of inspiration? So, VSTs for synths was it uh or just vsts in general um yeah i mean i do tend to write a lot uh i do tend to use samplers as well quite a lot and then manipulate samples but i do use the zeta plugin a lot uh zeta synth which i find really really good and uh let me actually just take a look if i if i open up a, a new track here and I can take a look at the sort of stuff I've been using um, so yeah UE Diva I definitely use a fair bit that's an absolute monster monster synth um, but I really really would recommend the uh, the Zeta which is by Cakewalk and that's spelt uh, Z3TA and that's actually totally free and it's totally amazing um yeah i'll bring one up here on my project so that you can see um full display application screen so yeah this is the zeta here really really well worth a grab as i said yeah it's completely free and it's got all sorts of wicked sounds especially good for trancey trancey stuff um also the korg m1 plugin is good and get all sorts of classic garage vibes going on in there um yeah okay oh actually there was another question there wasn't there there was uh, inspiration uh well i haven't actually been writing that much music um i've got a 11 week baby at home so a lot of our time is spent hanging out with a little Margot, um, although I have just started to kind of get back on the production a bit and working on some music for potential kind of TV sync advertising stuff at the moment. So not really uh, quite as clubby, but quite fun to do something different. All right, let's take a look at the other questions. Tons of them coming in. All right. Tal, roughly how much mix down would you usually do prior to this process? Um, well, I wouldn't really do too much, I guess what I would classically think of as the mixing, part of the EQing and compressing, but I would be putting effects on tracks while I'm writing. So definitely it will be using delays and reverbs and kind of all that sort of thing while I'm writing. But then I tend to do the compression and the EQing and most of the distortion during the mix down process in the separate project. Do I leave it till this time to add time-based effects? Uh, no, so I would do actually some of that in the writing, yeah, as I just said. Okay, I can see a lot of these kind of similar. Do I do a lot different when I know I'm gonna be pressing to vinyl? Nope, do it exactly the same. <laughs> and uh, can I leave it to the mastering engineer to do the vinyl master that's needed for that um i don't think i'm not aware that you need to do anything differently when thinking about mixing down for vinyl as long as the mastering engineer knows what they're doing then you should be fine how do i use the stereo imager um i actually didn't go over really what i use it for but um the stereo imager I use to check whether things are in mono or kind of how big they are in the stereo field. I mean, obviously, you can hear that as well in uh, 
your speakers and in your headphones but I do find that sometimes it is helpful to also get a bit of a visual image of what's going on um, so with like a kick drum I'd like check that it's in mono and you can see on the imager whether it's kind of flashing out all wide or whether it's coming out straight down the middle um, with some kind of splashy hats or uh, you know a pad paddy synth maybe I want to have the stereo image further out wide and so I'll kind of take a look at what the image looks like at first and if it's kind of still somewhere in the middle I'll use a stereo imager to push it out further afield or uh, some sort of delay effects to create a wider stereo image Freddie's asking, could you possibly walk through the sends process? Might need another video for that. Um, yeah, I mean, that is, I guess, that's a slightly different, slightly different thing. But uh, if we go to full display. Um, so if I'm in my project here in Ableton and I've like stuck a bunch of sends on, down here, I've stuck some effect, some effects on some tracks here with some reverbs and delays, etc. Then when I export the stems, they will be kind of printed as their own audio files. And so those are what these ones are here. You got uh, the huge reverb send and uh, the smaller reverb send. And Basically, yeah, so this will be just the wet effects that are coming out from the send. And that means that I've got kind of whatever I put those effects on, they're going to come into the mixdown project dry, but then I've still got the effects on them separately. So, I mean, using sends, yeah, that is kind of, I guess, probably a, a whole topic for another video. But um, hopefully that's a little bit useful. Maybe I'll do another, do a video on uh, sends and some other stuff like that. All right, Tom asks, uh, when starting a track, which uh, which elements do you build the foundations with? So I almost always start with the drums, um, which is kind of, yeah, rhythm track in general. I'd say drums and bass. Uh, I remember watching a... Uh, video tutorial years ago that Rusko did and he basically he said that if you can't listen to just the drum track of your song like all the way through from start to finish then the drums aren't good enough and that's just kind of always stuck with me and I just do find it easier I think to get started with drums and then the bass and then I'll go on to melodic elements or kind of weird effectsy things after that but I can't I want to get the groove going be able to kind of feel it and then I can kind of hear where the rest of the tracks can go from there all right Simon asks uh, what's the average amount of time you spend on making the track versus the mix down so I tend to write quite quickly and to be honest, now I mix down quite quickly as well, although I guess that's not really a number. I think to write a track usually takes altogether about, I don't know, five, six hours of work probably. And then the mix down takes about half an hour to an hour. Yeah, usually... I'd say probably about an hour, an hour on mixing down the track. So definitely the majority is the writing. When I was mixing stuff down before, it would take me longer. But after using this technique for kind of a few years, it's become quite a smooth, smooth process. I mean, I can do another video another time on actually how I do the actual mix. But uh, yeah, this is just kind of the framework.
All right, Jamie, when working with pads, do you have any tips to get rid of resonance besides just EQing it out? One of my hardware synths is pretty resonant with pad sounds and it's really hard to make it set, make it cleaner on the initial recording. Um, I mean, EQing is really kind of going to be the ultimate tool here, but fine. Chorus is a good way of smoothing things out. Uh, obviously, kind of some small reverbs as well is going to give you just a slightly fuller sound and you won't hear the resonant peaks as much. But the key, I think, is really just notching out uh, notching out those peaks it might take quite a few notches and then what you're left with then kind of boosts the rest of that sound back up again um, yeah that's uh, that's how I do it okay what's my process when building my arrangements um, so when I, I used a trick for a while that I found really useful, which was I would drag, uh, I basically have like have my track kind of just in, uh, in Ableton in um, uh, not an arrangement mode. What's the other one called? In, uh, da, 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 da. what are they called? We've got arrangement mode and... Uh, the other mode, the kind of creative one with all the blocks in. And um, yeah, basically I would, yeah, once I had everything written out, to get a good arrangement, what I would do is drag in a track that I really liked. And then I was using the markers on Ableton, I would plot out um, what, kind of what was happening in the track. Um, so I can actually just sh probably show you that quickly here. So if I go back to uh, display capture, so might have uh, yeah, I can see like I'd be doing this with uh, a full with just an audio file, right, of a of a track, but. Let's say that we could see that, uh, you know what, actually, it doesn't really make sense to do it with this. Let's drag in a track and I can show you. Um, okay. So, drag in a track into Ableton. And then I'd kind of see, I'd listen through and hear like, all right, the kick starts here. Um, and then I would create a marker, which God, I haven't actually done this for a while. How do you create, oh, add a, lo a locator right there. And I'd say like kick enters, all right. And then here it might be bass enters. And then this might be kick and bass drops out, right? Mm -mm. Obviously, I'd be listening to the track and working this out without uh, just guessing. Bass and kick drops out, right? And then once I'd have all these markers in, I would just get rid of the audio track. And then what I'm left with is kind of a paint by numbers situation. And then I just take my like everything that I've got in my arrangement and then I just plot it out on here. Just stick the kick in, add the bass over the top and it might be like, you know, melodic element comes in here, effects enters here, um, main motif enters here and then I just copy the arrangement. And that, uh, yeah, that basically, you're kind of guaranteed a good arrangement as long as you pick a track that you like that has a good arrangement. Um, and now... I guess I've just kind of done it enough to be able to hear how uh, I think it should hear it, how I think it should go. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers that question.
Okay, if you were to automate the volumes or dynamics of certain tracks, would you automate in the writing phase or save it for the mix down? I would do that in the writing phase. Uh, and although probably, I mean, you might do a little bit in the mix down as well. I do sometimes find that I end up rearranging and restructuring stuff during the mix down because once I bring everything down to zero and start bringing each element up one by one, you can hear much more clearly how everything's working together. And so often I find that my arrangement was actually too cluttered when I was writing it in Ableton and I got used to hearing it with all this extra sound in and it sounded weird to have it without. But once I started like bringing <clears throat> everything up one by one, I'd realized that actually sections sounded totally great with far fewer elements within them. And so then I might actually do some kind of arrangement work during the mix down, or I might find that some section is too long and I'll cut it out during the mix down. And so yeah, there's still kind of a little bit of writing going on there as well. You'll kind of hear the song in a, in a new light as uh, you're mixing. Jennifer asking, do you use much mid-side processing to help with the stereo image business? Um, no, I do do quite a lot of, yeah, I do not so much mid-side, actually, just, just kind of, yeah, just far wides. And then, you know, that's actually not true. I think in, when I have quite a lot of percussion, I will stick things out a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right it's kind of maybe 10 degrees here 10 degrees over there um depending on what it is and then yeah i like to have kind of the more uh you know tambourines uh crashes kind of hi-hats and stuff out quite wide and then stuff which has more of a thwack your snares and kind of toms and stuff like that more uh mono and, and more in the center I find that that kind of helps everything sit quite well together. Hey, when you bring up each track, do you use the channel strip, gain, compression, and EQ on each one by one? Um, bring up each track, channel strip. Yes. Yes, I do. Exactly, yeah. So bring up one, EQ out kind of uh, any resonant peaks or any like low end stuff that doesn't need to be there. Um, compress it and then kind of go and then do any sort of uh, any more work that I'm going to want to do on that channel there and then. So most channels I end up adding some distortion to with uh, the sound toys decapitator, even if it's just uh, to kind of thicken it up. Um, and yeah, just kind of go along one by one, repeating the process. Uh, Andy, am I going to be doing any more production videos like this? Yeah, I reckon so. <laughs> any decent plugins uh, to recommend for making bass lines? People are always asking me, uh, where do you get the bass lines? But uh, yeah, I mean, I write a lot of the bass lines on Ableton using, what do I use? A bit of Diva, a bit of um, Operator, which is an Ableton inbuilt, inbuilt synth, and also uh, the Max, Max bass synth I use a lot as well. Um, yeah, it's actually Max, Max bass like on Ableton, as in like a Max for Live bass synth, that's uh, that get used. That gets used a lot. Um, Sam asking, do you find yourself still adding more effects in the mix down? If so, which ones do you tend to leave until last? Yep, yeah, definitely do. Still add effects here and there. I mean, often I'll find. You know, I'm like listening through to a section and it's like, oh, actually, you know, this bit of percussion could do with a bit of delay to transition from one section to another. Um, it's a bit too kind of harsh, the cut at the moment. So add some delay or some, some reverb in there to help things kind of gel 
and uh, I wouldn't really say I'd say I, I'd use kind of uh, more uh, like kind of um, I don't really know if there's a name for this but kind of delays and bigger reverbs and stuff like that I'd, I'd probably do last whereas stuff like distortion gating um, kind of stuff that has like an effect on the sound in a it doesn't make the sound like kind of longer um, I would yeah the I would do those getting all in a muddle here. Yeah, this so stuff like um, distortion, etc. I tend to do first and then like reverb and delays I do at the end. Okay, James, how do you choose what subtle sound effects I noise risers, random bleeps, lasers to add into a track. Do you have a bunch of signature patches or do you just go through sample li sample libraries to find what fits? Um, no, I also have a template that I start every track with and that's got a whole bunch of drum racks with different effects and bleep bloops and swing swangs and dingle dangles and kind of all the little sounds you're going to want to sprinkle over the track to create a kind of finished product. And so I just spent a day kind of going through sample libraries and finding just tons of different little weird sounds that I liked and then created a bunch of drum racks with those in. And so they're kind of already ready and waiting for me to just bash out on the push once uh, once I'm, I get started on the track. So I try not to spend too much time searching through any libraries once I'm actually writing. Um, anything which takes you out of the moment of getting in the flow and writing the track is bad. It's a bad time. You just want to be in the zone and when you like have an idea for a sound you want to just be able to just do the sound and when you want to like find a weird laser sound or a weird bleepy blingle you just want to have that right there. You don't want to spend half an hour scrolling through and auditioning tons of different sounds because then you're not in the flow and it's hard to get back into the zone. Alvaro, at what level in DB uh, do you try to leave the mix down before mastering? Um, I always try to leave at least uh, minus three DB. So somewhere between minus six and minus three. Uh, Johnny, uh, would be cool to know how you started your label and how it works. I mean, okay, that's, that's, uh, I guess a slightly different topic, but it's all good. I mean, it was started as an outlet for my own music, um, but I did always want to release my friends' tracks on there, and pretty much everything on there is written by one of my close mates, um, yeah, I wasn't really interested in trying to kind of just get a bunch of bigger artists and put out their music. Um, and fortunate enough to be surrounded by a bunch of absolute musical legends. So it was just kind of, uh, made itself really. Just the friends started sending in the tracks and there were just so many good ones. So just kind of started putting them out and yeah, it turns out. I guess uh, a lot of people heard kind of what I heard in them as well, which is that they're a bunch of sick heads. Um, yeah, so that's kind of how it started and how it works. I'm not sure exactly how to answer that other than uh, just the friends send the tracks over and I um, put out records kind of for... To, well it's been four a year but I'm trying to do more this year and then uh, do the digital comes out a month later and then I also have the reissues side label holding hands again where I just basically am kind of digging on my travels through record shops and uh, on discogs and then when I find stuff that I really like the sound of generally it tends to be stuff that like a record I find that I love but I don't want to spend a ridiculous amount of money on buying it and so Kind of the best way to do it is just to 
reissue it and then i get sent the tracks <laughs> and you get to put it back out again as well and uh stop all these ridiculous prices of records on discogs uh elliot do you build build ideas of your tracks in session or arrangement view this is the word i was looking for um session view yes i write everything in session view so to be clear let's go over to uh display capture so that is on ableton that's this this one here this is session view and uh this is really like the main reason why I moved over from Logic to Ableton for writing is because of the session view. And so you're just basically creating obviously tons of, I mean, if you use Ableton, obviously you don't need me to explain to you what this is, but if you don't use Ableton, then uh, the reason why it's so good is because each of these little boxes is where you write or add loops into. And then I just find that I can, you can be so much more creative on the fly with the loops and you can kind of audition how lots of different groupings of them will work together. Whereas if I'm on Logic, I find that once I've got kind of a little loop going here at the beginning, it's quite hard to, I find, imagine. Sometimes I just, yeah, I find it much uh, easier to just hard to imagine the kind of like where the track would go i'd get stuck listening to the same loop over and over again I'd maybe you know i'd be muting and soloing stuff together to hear how it sounds but then dragging it out it kind of felt like i was forced to be arranging the track at the same time that i was writing the track and that for me i found quite stifling when it came to the um to the creative element of it so when I moved over to Ableton, uh, I found that when I was writing in session view, I could just like bash these ideas out, get like one really, really long line of sort of loops and then try loads of them out together. And then I write uh, kind of, yeah, write the track and then create the, the arrangement downwards in the session view. Yeah, I can actually, if I open up a recent set then you can see uh, what I'm talking about here. Um, I'll get that opening while I'm uh, going through another question. <laughs> Tom uh, Carter, please, can I do this for the rest of the day? Uh, <laughs> I think... Uh, probably need to go do a bit of looking after uh the little baby in a bit so probably not but i'll definitely come back and do one over the next uh, next week and we'll do some more but uh what are my favorite tips and tricks when approaching a vocal sample for effects you love my dingle dangles well thanks very much um vocal sample effects i mean the sampler on Ableton is just like so, so powerful. You just kind of stick stuff in there and then just get messing around in there. I think probably I'll go into more detail on uh, little production tips and tricks on, an, on another video. Um, but here I've got my, uh, got a session up here. Um, so this is what a track looks and uh looks like when i've written it in in session view so these different sections here and then i just basically have it all uh, kind of working downwards and then i record this and i play it in live i just like hit the record button and then i literally play it as if i was playing it live and i'll you know play this section for eight bars then this section for eight bars and this section for eight bars etc and then it all gets recorded in to the arrangement view like this. And uh, then you're uh, kind of, yeah, all good to go to, uh, to start arranging.
Yeah. Oh, yeah. As uh, Nicholas has pointed out, Oak Sound Soothe is uh, it's the ultimate tool for smoothing out resonance. Um, yeah, I've had a, a few people recommend that, including Breaker. Uh, it's kind of like an automatic um, EQ that finds peaks and, and removes them. It's meant to be amazing. Yeah, so I think probably just time for one or two more questions. But uh, Miles, are my bleep loops from sample packs or do you create them yourself? Mostly they're from sample packs. Yeah, I just kind of collected a whole ton of sample packs over the years and there's just a million bleep loops in there. Um, but a lot more of the kind of expansive effects that I have that I might find you might find in my tracks stuff that's kind of a bit more evolving or a bit uh, kind of got a bit more going on than just little clicks and snaps. Um, those I would have made myself. Um, what does my template for writing a track look like? Um, let's see if I if we can get one up here. Uh, da, 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 da. Music, Ableton, user library, templates. Okay, this might take a uh, a minute to load. In fact, I've recently just, after using this template for a couple of years, I've actually just stopped using it, and I'm about to make a new one. Um, I think this one's just got a bit too much going on in it, but we'll load it up and see uh, see how uh, see how it looks. Okay, when you go from session to arrangement view, do you bounce MIDI to audio uh, for drums, for example? When I go from session to no, they're still staying in uh, still staying in MIDI to begin with. So while, when I'm in Ableton, everything's in kind of MIDI and audio all mixed up together. There's effects, there's uh, soft synths, there's samplers. Um, MIDI drums are kept as, as MIDI. It's only once I export all the stems at the end that I turn everything into audio. Um, okay, yeah, so I've got a template up here. So this is what it looks like. So we've got kicks here, hi-hats. You can see like I've got drum racks down here. I open hi-hats and, uh, you know, got lots of different sounding things, um, different perks, effects. Yeah, this is where some of the bleep loops are. Some little, little bits here. You know, um, yeah, so this is kind of what a, what a template normally looks like when I start it. So I've just got everything set up all along here that I need to write kind of a basic track. Um, yeah, I think that's probably going to be it for today. But uh, thank you everyone for tuning in and I hope it's been helpful. I definitely come back. We'll uh, do some other ones. If you've got any like specific topics that you want me to, to cover, then uh, send me a message or post them on the chat down there. And uh, yeah, see you guys again soon. I hope you have a productive lockdown. Um, see you later.